Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. In this session, I am starting with the development of gastrointestinal system. So this session will be again a topic uh, known, as, uh, known as the folding of embryo. Because without knowing how the embryo folds, you won't be able to understand the development of gastrointestinal system. So in this session, uh, many of you have asked me to already asked me to do a session on the folding of embryo. So I was waiting uh, to start the development of GID so that along with that I will explain the folding of embryo. So uh, even though the session is on development of GIT, uh, we will first uh, know how the folding of the embryo occurs uh, so that uh, we will get a clear idea about the gastrointestinal tube, the primitive gut how the primitive gut is formed. So in the beginning we know that uh, the embryo is in the form of a disc isn't it after by the end of third week we know that there is a formation of trilamina germ disc and after the third week we know that there is development of intraembryonic mesoderm the notochord the neural tube everything. So uh, if you are watching general embryology for the first time I wish uh, you should see the sessions which I have done earlier in general embryology that is the development in the first week, second week, third week and uh, session on the intraembryonic mesoderm. If you see all these sessions then you will get a continuity for the present session. So in the beginning we know that uh, the embryo is in the form of a disc isn't it? It is just like uh, two slices of uh, bread with a butter in between. Two slices of bread you can uh, compare it with the uh, epiblast and hypoblast or the prim uh, ectoderm, primitive ectoderm and the endoderm and in between uh, the jam or the butter can you can consider it as the intraembryonic mesoderm. So it was just in the form of a disc. Now uh, what happens is you know so this is actually a coronal section so if you just imagine the entire embryo is in the form of a sphere uh, how would you get above you have the amniotic cavity and below you have the yolk sac and in between you have the trilaminar germ discs this view we have already seen so that is how uh, we get the embryo and now this is the coronal section if you have the embryo like this you if you take a coronal section and if you just wa uh, wash it from in front, this will be the view. So that you can see this is the amniotic cavity. This is the yolk sac. Okay, yolk sac. And this is the ectoderm. The entire thing, this is the endoderm. And in between, this green color is the intraembryonic mesoderm. In the middle, you have the neural tube and the notochord formed. And you have the extraembryonic mesoderm surrounding it. This is the coronal section and if you take it uh, lengthwise, the embryonic disc lengthwise, this is the view. Okay, so this is the coronal section. So if you take the embryo as such like this and if you take a coronal section and if you look from in front, this is the view. If you take the entire embryo and if you cut it along the length of the embryo, from the cranial to caudal axis because you know by the formation of the primitive streak and uh, the precordal plate you have the cranial caudal axis of the embryo already established so if you make a cut along the midline this will be the view of the embryo okay so this is the coronal session and this is the sagittal session so what are the things which you can make out in this session in this session again you have the amniotic cavity here this is the yolk sac, okay, this is the yolk sac, this is the amniotic cavity. So this will be the ectoderm and this will be the endoderm. In between the green colored region is the intraembryonic mesoderm because it is within the embryo. And here you, have, you can see the uh, neural tube and below you can see the notochord. I have been mentioned it in this uh, small diagram. We will come to uh, see the details in the uh, next diagram. So for the time being you imagine that the ectoderm lies above which is in contact with the amniotic fluid. Then the endoderm is in communication with the yolk sac and in between you have the intraembryonic mesoderm where you get the neural tube followed by notochord. Now if you just want to name the structures from so if this is the cranial end of the embryonic disc this is the caudal end of the embryonic disc okay so from cranial to caudal let's see the structures which are there this is known as 
septum transversum okay septum transversum we know that septum transversum is a major part from which you have the development of the diaphragm you can see a session on diaphragm which i have already done then you have the pericardial region so the cardiac region with the pericardial cavity and the developing heart okay and this region what is the peculiarity of this region this region is a region where you won't get the intra embryonic mesoderm between the ectoderm and endoderm so this region is known as buccopharyngeal membrane or oropharyngeal membrane all these things we have already seen so the region at the cranial end where there is no intervening intra embryonic mesoderm and this is seen as a circular patch in the midline and that region is known as buccopharyngeal membrane or oropharyngeal membrane then as you move cordially you will be seeing the ectoderm above you will be seeing the endoderm below in between you have the intra embryonic mesoderm there you have the neural tube above and the Uh, notochord below all these structures will be there in a stretch till it reaches the caudal end so what is the peculiarity of the caudal end there again similar to the buccopharyngeal membrane you can see another membrane this is known as cloacal membrane so what's the peculiarity of cloacal membrane here similar to buccopharyngeal membrane there again you have the ectoderm and endoderm lying so close to each other without any intervening intra embryonic mesoderm so that's the peculiarity of cloacal membrane and then you have the connecting stalk this is known as the connecting stalk and this projection of the yolk sac into the connecting stalk is known as allantois allantois or allanto enteric diverticulum okay so these are the features which you get if you divide the embryo into two halves along the midline and you just view from the medial aspect of the embryo okay so from cranial to caudal end you have the septum transversum you have the pericardial region with the pericardial cavity and the developing heart then you have the buccopharyngeal membrane then you have the three layers with the neural tube and the notochord then you have the cloacal membrane at the caudal end again where there is no intra intervening intraembryonic mesoderm then you have the connecting stalk into which you have a projection of the yolk sac in the form of allantois or allantoenteric diverticulum so this is the arrangement of structures from cranial to caudal end okay now uh, what we are going to talk is we are going to discuss about the folding of the embryo the embryo cannot lie as a straight disc right it needs to fold so that there is a contour for the embryo it is actually contouring the embryo because otherwise it will be just like a flat fish but you know our body is not like that so for that the folding should occur now what are the uh, things which actually push the embryo into folding so uh, before that we should know what are the types of folding happening in the embryo one is at the cranial end the part of the embryo will bend on itself that is known as cephalic folding similarly at the caudal end a part of the embryo will fold on itself that is known as caudal folding so together in this axis you can call it as cranio caudal folding okay now similarly laterally so this is the cranio caudal folding or head folding and tail folding so this is the head end and this is the tail end isn't it so there are many terminologies used in the folding so uh, simply speaking this is the head end and this is the tail end so this can be considered as head folding and this can be considered as uh, tail folding and this happens in the cephalo caudal axis now this is what these are the lateral ends isn't it this is a if you take the embryo like this if you take it a take a cut coronally these are the lateral ends of the embryo right so the lateral ends also folds on itself so that all the folds will converge on the ventral aspect this is the dorsal aspect of the embryo and this is the ventral aspect of the embryo so the lateral folding will converge on the ventral aspect and the cranio caudal the cephalic and caudal folding will converge on the ventral aspect so you have to remember that all the foldings of the embryo will converge on the ventral aspect of the embryo okay 
Now in the session we will be more concentrating on the uh, uh, head folding and tail folding. Uh, the lateral folding we will see in detail in the next session. So what are the features or the, what are the factors promoting head folding and tail folding? So first we will see the cephalocaudal folding uh, and the uh, cephalocaudal folding. So what are the features which promote cephalocaudal folding? One of the most important feature is the growth of the central nervous system. Here we, have, we can see that uh, the neural tube is in line with the notochord and all the three, three germ layers are actually more or less lengthwise same. But later what happens is the neural tube here will overshoot. So what happens this uh, the, there is no place for the neural tube to lay within this uh, small space. So what happens this will actually overshoot and it will bend onto the ventral aspect. So that is the reason why you get uh, a cephalocaudal folding. And what is the reason for lateral folding? Lateral folding we know that there are somites formed in this region. Isn't it? The intraembryonic mesoderm is actually getting differentiated into three types paraxial, intermediate, and lateral plate. You know all these things. So, the paraxial mesoderm, there will be the formation of somites. And so, what happens? There is a elongation breadthwise. Breadthwise elongation happens, and there again, there won't be any space so that the embryo will start folding so that it will try to accommodate within the given space. So that is the reason for lateral folding. So the two reasons for cephalocaudal folding and lateral folding are lengthwise you have the elongation of the central nervous system and breadthwise you have the uh, uh, growth of the somites. So these are the two main reasons attributed for the two major folds. Now let's see what are the features happening in the uh, head folding of the embryo. So this is the amniotic cavity, this is the yolk sac. Now what happens is the amniotic cavity enlarges and along with the uh, growth of the uh, central nervous system. So what happens is this part of the embryo, this part of the embryo will bend on itself and will come and lie on the ventral aspect. So this will come and lie on this region, this will follow and the buccopharyngeal membrane will follow. So if this is one, two, three, what happens? Here it here comes the one followed by two, then three. So let's see how the structures are arranged after folding. So this is one. So this is one means this is septum transversum. So this is one here. This is the cardiac region with the pericardial cavity and the developing heart. So this is two. So this is one, two, three in the order. Here it is the cavity pericardial cavity and the developing heart here and 3 is the buccopharyngeal membrane or otherwise known as oropharyngeal membrane. So it is the 3 here. So this is 1, 2, 3 after folding. The uh, order is just reversed due to the head fold. Hope you understood. Isn't it? The septum transversum when it folds it comes and lie here. The allow, it will be followed by the pericardial cavity then it will be followed by the buccopharyngeal membrane and the entire amniotic cavity will actually follow this fold okay and you can see these are the three brain vesicles one two three these are the three brain vesicles and it is the growth of these brain vesicles which actually resulted in the head fold of the embryo now this is the buccopharyngeal membrane or oropharyngeal membrane and what you can see here is, can you see a dip like this here? So this dip in the ectoderm, this black color is the actually ectoderm, right? This dip in the ectoderm is actually known as stomodium. Stomodium, okay. Stomodium. So this dip is known as stomodium. And this buccopharyngeal membrane will be actually forming the floor of the stomodium okay so stomodium is actually a dip in the ectoderm due to the uh, cranial folding of the embryo and uh, the floor of the stomodium is occupied by the buccopharyngeal membrane and what do you get cra uh, cranial to the uh, stomodium you have the developing brain vesicle and caudal to the stomodium you have the 
cardiac region so imagine so what is stomodium actually stomodium is actually our future oral cavity so it is ectodermal in origin because it is made up of ectoderm right so stomodium is our future oral cavity and it is ectodermal in origin so imagine you have the mouth here we just mentioned cranially you have the brain vesicle and caudally it is mentioned that it is the heart are you getting heart here no so but you know the position of heart the adult heart but what happened to the adult heart later on so later on what happens is you know there are pharyngeal arches developing just below the oral cavity isn't it so the development of pharyngeal arches will push the cardiac region lower down to the adult position that is the reason why in adults you are not seeing this relation okay so soon after folding this will be the relation followed and you have the septum transversum below the cardiac region because you know the diaphragm is below the heart isn't it so that is the relation which is followed here and this buccopharyngeal membrane will rupture by say around fourth week and what happens as a result there will be a communication with the of the gut with the exterior that is how the oral cavity is communicating with the gastrointestinal tube the primitive gut tube okay and that ruptures by the fourth week now similar to that uh, there is a caudal folding of the embryo so what happens so what are the structures seen at the caudal region you have the cloacal membrane and you have the allantois okay so one this is two so what should happen when this folds like this two should come and first and later on what should come the one should come the uh, cloacal membrane should come so let's see after folding what is it so this projection is our allantois and that you can mark it as two and this membrane the cloacal membrane it is one so the order is reversed to one one two in the craniocaudal direction before folding will after folding it will be two one that is uh, the allantoic diverticulum followed by the clo cloacal membrane now similar to the stomodium there is a pit developed in the ectoderm just opposite to the cloacal membrane that pit is known as proctodium what do you call it proctodium so stomodium anteriorly and proctodium posteriorly so proctodium another term given by datta sir in his book is ectodermal cloaca so you have the endodermal cloaca formed from the endoderm and this is ectodermal in origin right so you have the ectodermal cloaca which is also known as proctodium because some of the books if you refer you will see this as ectodermal cloaca so you should not confuse between proctodium and ectodermal cloaca because they both are same and there is a membrane that is mean that is known as the cloacal membrane and the cloacal membrane will usually rupture by fifth week and what happens then the gut tube will have a communication with exterior through the anal opening okay so that is what is happening at the caudal end now let's see about the yolk sac uh, during this cranial and caudal folding i am not talking about the lateral folding uh, this is the lateral folding and you know that the amniotic cavity is also approaching towards the ventral aspect uh, this uh, i will deal in the next session because then we have to talk about the intraembryonic coelom and the cavities and all uh, so we will just concentrate on the cephalic uh, folding and the caudal folding you know the structures how these structures the order is just reversed with the help of cephalic folding and caudal folding uh, now what happens is you know that the amniotic membrane when it is pushed towards the ventral aspect the, this is the connecting stalk right the connecting stalk also will come towards the ventral aspect and this uh, the entire connecting stalk will be now covered by the amniotic membrane and this is known as our umbilical cord okay or a primitive umbilical ring that is what what you call it in the beginning and what happened to our yolk sac during folding a part of the yolk sac is incorporated into the embryonic region and the part is remaining outside that is what is happening during the folding so the uh, yolk sac is actually uh, con getting constricted in the form of an hourglass uh, 
you know how an hourglass will look like it will be expanded at two ends with a narrow constriction in between which maintains the connection between the two ends isn't it so similarly the yolk sac a part of it is pushed into the embryo so that it forms a part of embryo but still a part of it will lie outside the embryo and it will be connected the connection will be maintained in the beginning stages and this connecting tube is known as vitello intestinal duct vitello intestinal duct okay so the connecting tube which connects the part of yolk sac which got incorporated in the embryo and the part which is lying outside that duct is known as vitello intestinal duct so the vitello intestinal duct will be passing through the uh, umbilical ring and it will be seen as a content of the umbilical cord the proximal portion of the umbilical cord in the beginning now uh, what is the fate of each part of the yolk sac so the intra embryonic yolk sac is actually giving rise to our primitive gut tube okay and the extra embryonic part which is lying outside the embryo is known as the umbilical vesicle so the umbilical vesicle is connected to the primitive gut through a duct known as vitello intestinal duct so that is what is happening to the yolk sac now we can see that the yolk sac is shrunken uh, and a part of it is getting absorbed into the embryo the amniotic cavity is getting enlarged and now the entire embryo is seen floating in the amniotic cavity that is actually what is happening towards uh, or what you are seeing the, you have you can see the uterine cavity then you can see the chorion the amnion inside you have the amniotic fluid and finally you have the embryo floating in it isn't it so this is how the embryo happens to float in the amniotic fluid and with the rupture of the buccopharyngeal membrane it will start here you have the amniotic fluid right this is the amniotic cavity the amniotic fluid it will start swallowing the amniotic fluid and with the rupture of cloacal membrane i will deal uh, i will uh, give you the details of the cloacal membrane rupturing into urogenital membrane and anal membrane and all so and uh, finally it will be the amniotic fluid which is sucked by the or swallowed by the embryo will be actually uh, coming back to the amniotic cavity in the form of urine that is how the circulation of the amniotic fluid is maintained now we will talk about the intra embryonic part of yolk sac so the part of the yolk sac which is seen in the head fold region so this is the head fold region right up to the septum transversum this is known as foregut okay so foregut the entire tube extending from the buccopharyngeal membrane to the cloacal membrane is known as primitive gut and the part which is lying in the head fold you call it as foregut similarly the part which is lying in the tail fold region that is actually known as hindgut okay and the region which is lying in between these two this is known as midgut this is known as hindgut and the middle portion is known as midgut so there is a continuity between foregut and midgut between midgut and hindgut isn't it so the junction between foregut and midgut you call it as anterior intestinal portal similarly the junction between midgut and hindgut you call it as posterior intestinal portal okay so there are two portals anterior and posterior intestinal portals and they are seen at the junction of foregut and midgut and midgut and hindgut now the hindgut is further divided by the presence of this allantois you can see the allantois projecting isn't it so the allantois will divide the hindgut into a pre allantoic region and a post allantoic region okay so pre allantoic region cranial to the allantois and post allantoic region caudal to the allantois so pre pre allantoic part will be in communication with the midgut and the post allantoic part is known as cloaca or sometimes uh, since this pit is known as ectodermal cloaca this cloaca can be known as 
endodermal cloaca. So, the hindgut is divided into pre-allantoic part and post-allantoic part depending upon the position of allantois and the post-allantoic part, this is the post-allantoic part and that portion is known as endodermal cloaca and it is the endodermal cloaca which is further divided by the urorectal septum into uh, the bladder anteriorly and, and the uh, rectum and anal canal posteriorly. So we will come to the details of all those things uh, in the coming sessions. Uh, so please keep watching. So this is uh, about the head folding and tail folding of the embryo and uh, we will be seeing in detail about the lateral folding and the derivatives of the gut tube in the coming days. Thanks for watching.